So good afternoon. This is Diana Arias for the Community Technical Assistance Center, and I would like to welcome you to today's webinar, Early Onset Persistent Depressive Disorder. Again, welcome. Um, we are very excited to have with us Dr. Danielle Klein from the Department of Psychology at Stony Brook University. Um, and at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Klein to get us started. Thank you, Diana. Uh, and it's a pleasure to be here. Hello, everybody. Uh, as Diana said, I'm, I'm, I'm Dan Klein from the Department of Psychology at Stony Brook University. I'm a clinical psychologist, and for much of my career, at least the early part of my career, I tended to work with uh, adults with chronic depression. And many of them uh, reported that they had been depressed since childhood or adolescence. Uh, often for their entire lifetime. And so at some point I began to shift my interests to study young children and to look at the antecedents of chronic depression. And I'll, I'll mention a little bit of that, of that work today. Uh, so, all right, so, so over the course of this talk, I'll talk some about the symptomatology of persistent depressive disorder, uh, which, which is the diagnostic category. I'll use that term interchangeably with chronic depression talk a bit about risk factors for persistent depressive disorder and about assessing persistent depressive disorder. I'll also talk about how it similar, similar to and differs from major depressive disorder, and then talk a little bit about the treatment of persistent disorder, the depressive disorder. A lot of, I, I know that the audience is primarily interested in children and adolescents. A lot of what I'll talk about is work on adults because there really hasn't been very much work done on persistent depressive disorder in children and adolescents. But like I said, for many adults with persistent depressive disorder, it began in childhood or adolescence. So even this work is, is relevant. Uh, Vanessa, can you advance the slide? All right, so why don't we start off with a poll question, which is, you know, to what extent do you consider persistent depressive disorder as part of your assessment when you're working with children and youth? Uh, and you can take a few minutes and, uh, and fill this in, and uh, I'll come back and, and share the results with you when I get them. Uh, in the meantime, Vanessa, can you advance the slide again? Whoops. I think I might have control of it now. Uh, great. All right. So um, this, this picture here is one of my favorite uh, literary characters with persistent depressive disorder. You may recognize Winnie the... Uh, Eeyore from Winnie the Pooh. And Eeyore goes through life, even on sunny days, with a dark gray rain cloud hovering above him. I think he's a really, uh, he really captures what persistent depressive disorder is all about. So, uh, his, so depressive disorders have been, you know, have been historically conceptualized as episodic and remitting conditions. People have depressive episodes and they get better. Really wasn't until the 1980s and 1990s that people began to recognize that sometimes depression can be chronic. And in 1980, the diagnostic category of dysthymic disorder was introduced into the diagnostic classification system for the first time. Uh, the diagnostic classification system, as many of you know, in the United States is the DSM, or the uh, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorder, published by the American Psychiatric Association. And every decade or two, it's revised and, and it gets a sort of a new number. So in 1980, it was the DSM-3. And in 2013, the fifth edition of the DSM came out. And in that, the category of chronic depression was renamed Persistent Depressive Disorder, or PDD. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that in a few minutes. Um, here we go. So, so Chronic depression or persistent depressive disorder is a relatively common disorder. In the community, about four and a half percent of people in the community uh, have, will or have experienced chronic depression or pers persistent depressive disorder at some time in their lives. And as I mentioned, the onset is often early. It's often in childhood and adolescence. Of cases of depressive disorder in the community, about 30% of them have PDD and the rest have major depressive disorder. Uh, in outpatient mental health settings, the rate goes up because people who've been depressed for a long time are more likely to seek treatment. So about half of the mood disorder cases in outpatient mental health settings have PDD. Uh, 
I should note that that chronic depression or PDD does not is not equivalent to a treatment refractory depression. That is, treatment refractory means people are not responding to treatment. Chronic doesn't mean that 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 they've not responded to treatment. In fact, most patients with chronic depression have never had an adequate trial of either medication or psychotherapy. And if we look at what predicts failure to respond to treatment for depression, clonazepam is not one of the one of the stronger predictors. So just because somebody is chronically depressed is not necessarily a reason to be pessimistic about the likelihood that they will respond to treatment. Oh, we have the results of our poll here. And so uh, it looks like sometimes is the, is the dominant response here. So about 8% indicated that they always think about PDD as part of their assessment. 22% said very often, 42% said sometimes, 20% rarely and 7% never. So hopefully some of you will, will, will think about this a bit, a bit more in your, in your practice uh, after this talk. So chronic depression can take a variety of forms. And the fourth edition of the DSM uh, laid out what a number of those forms can be. So one is dysthymic disorder. Dysthymic disorder refers to a mild, low-grade chronic depression. Oftentimes, people with dysthymic disorder go through periods where the depression becomes more severe. It's sort of the experience and exacerbation that might meet criteria for a major depressive episode. And that combination of a dysthymic disorder with a sort of superimposed exacerbation of a major depressive episode is often referred to as double depression. Some people have a chronic major depressive episode. It's a moderate or severe depression that just won't go away, that's just persistent. Uh, so it's not mild, it's actually moderate or severe. Sometimes people will have a major depressive episode. They'll get better, but not all the way better. It'll be a partial remission, and they may, they may continue to experience uh, milder depressive symptoms for a long time afterwards. And that's referred to as major depression partial remission, and that can be another form of chronic depression. And one of the best predictors of a relapse or a recurrence of a major depressive episode is having low-grade depressive symptoms. So many of those people will then have another major depressive episode. So we'll have recurrent major depression and maybe many episodes, but in between which they never get back to a normal mood. They're always experiencing milder depressive symptoms. So that's another form uh, of chronic depression. There we go. So this is, this is just sort of a brief picture of, of what a double depression might look like. Somebody starts off with a normal level of mood, have a milder depression or dysthymia, and then it gets more severe into a major depression, and then they recover from the major depression, but they get back to the level of dysthymia, um, which is a partial recovery. Next slide, please. So DSM-5, which is the current classification system that we work with, consolidated a number of the forms of chronic depression from DSM-4. So I showed you some of those forms. They now all fall under the single category of persistent depressive disorder. The diagnostic criteria for persistent depressive disorder is first of all, and most importantly, being depressed most of the day, more days than not, for at least two years. So being depressed at least half the time for at least two years. For children and adolescents, the criterion is relaxed to one year, and that's because you know, one year is a pretty large period in the life of a child or adolescent. Um, for an adult, you know, two years is sort of maybe a comparable chunk of time. Uh, so depressed more most of the day, more days than not for at least two years, one year for children or adolescents. In addition, one needs to have at least two out of six of the following symptoms. People who've been depressed more than half the time for a year or two usually have more than two symptoms. So it's not, it's not too hard to meet the symptom criteria here if you're depressed that much of the time. But you need to have at least two of these six symptoms, increased or decreased appetite, increased or decreased sleep. So it could be sleeping too much, taking lots of naps, or having difficulty falling asleep, waking up a lot during the night, waking up too, morning, uh, too early in the morning low energy or fatigue, low self-esteem, poor concentration, like being unable to follow a conversation or follow a TV show, uh, or difficulty making decisions. And I'm not talking about sort of 
big important decisions, but everyday decisions like what to wear, what, what clothes to put on in the morning, what to eat, uh, and hopelessness. Uh, and you can never be free of those symptoms for more than two months during this two year or one year period. So it truly is persistent. It's persisting throughout the two years or for children, adolescents, one year. In the DSM, there's a specifier or subtype regarding age of onset. And I think that's particularly relevant for, for this audience. And that is one needs to specify whether the uh, persistent depressive disorder started before the age of 21, which is an early, considered an early onset or after the age of 21. Uh, can I have the next slide? Uh, and there's a reason for, for why that specifier is there. It, it, it is an important distinction. Um, compared to the later onset cases, early onset cases that is beginning before age 21 have much greater comorbidity with other psychiatric disorders. So they're more likely to have co-occurring anxiety disorders, personality disorders, behavior disorders, substance disorders. They're much more likely to have a history of early childhood adversity or maltreatment. And there are much higher rates of, of depression in their family members and their parents and their siblings. And most of the research on PDD has focused on this early onset subtype. And that's what I will concentrate on. People who have an onset of PDD in childhood or adolescence. Uh, late onset PDD, I think is a somewhat different condition and it's, often associated with chronic stressors and health problems, and less likely with comorbidity, early maltreatment in, in family history. So, so persistent depressive disorder tends to be under-recognized and under-diagnosed. And there are a few reasons for that. One is that when patients come in for treatment, be it outpatient treatment, uh, the emergency room, whatever, whatever setting they're coming in with, there's usually something acute going on that has motivated them to seek treatment. And whatever that acute condition or problem is, that's usually what, what uh, uh, um, attracts the most attention of the mental health clinician who's assessing them, and rightfully so. So the focus might be on a new major depressive episode or suicidality or some other kind of major stressor or or problem in their lives. Uh, and that tends to attract the attention and, and we often don't recognize that there's a chronic depression that has preceded it often for many years. Another reason is that persisting low-grade depressions may often appear uh, sort of normal or characteristic to the person who's experiencing them. It's their characteristic affective state and they don't recognize that what they're experiencing is different from what many other people experience. They don't recognize that they're depressed. See, that's what normal is to them, and they assume everyone else feels that way. And it's not unusual uh, for a patient who is successfully treated to tell you that they've never felt normal before. They, they had always assumed that how they felt was normal, but now, now that they actually are euthymic and are not depressed, they recognize that they had never felt that way before. And lastly, it's challenging and time consuming to assess the history and course of a disorder. It's sort of more straightforward to, you know, to, to get, get the, the, the current mental state, to find out about uh, current symptoms. It's much harder to delve into the history and course of a disorder. Can I have the, the next slide? So yes, so, so dysthymia is a, is certainly a form of, of chronic depression, sort of a mild chronic depression. Um, so, so I think that the best way to assess uh, the course of depression is, uh, to, is, is, is to do it graphically. Uh, literally sit down with your, with your patient or, or if it's child with the parent of the child and take out a pencil and paper and draw a graph and sit there and, and, and collaboratively work with them on the, the, uh, the y-axis uh, is, is their mood state ranging from an elevated mood state, maybe even mania, to depressed, to severely depressed. And on the x-axis is time and work backwards with them from their current depression backward to understand when it started and how it has shifted over time. Uh, so next slide. 
So, so it might look something like this, where, where the patient is coming in with a mild chronic depression, but you discover that at some point in the past, they had a more severe depression, but before that, they were more mildly depressed for a number of years. Uh, and then there was some point, presumably, although not always, where, where they weren't depressed at all. Next slide, please. So, uh, so before I had, I had noted the many different sort of varieties or forms of, of chronic depression, that appeared in the DSM-4. So why did DSM-5 consolidate them into a single category? Well, the reason is there really are very few difference, differences between the various forms of chronic depression that I described. I mean, they differ in their severity at a given point in time, but looking at the bigger picture, they really don't differ very much. So for one thing, dyslimia or mild chronic depression is almost always double depression eventually that somewhere between three quarters and almost everybody with dysthymia will experience more severe major depressive episodes and therefore have double depression. Also, there've been a couple of studies that have compared dysthymia, double depression, chronic major depression, and recurrent major depression with incomplete remissions between episodes and found that they're really very similar in terms of comorbidity or co-occurrence with other psychiatric disorders. We look at their personality traits and their depressive cognitions like rumination, they're pretty similar. They have similar histories of childhood maltreatment and adversity. Rates of psychopathology, psychiatric disorders and family members are pretty similar. Uh, their response to treatment is pretty similar and their course over time is pretty similar as well. Next slide. Uh, these are, this is a brief summary of a study that I did uh, some time ago. It was a 10-year follow-up study of patients with chronic depression, and we followed them over 10 years, uh, and a number of them recovered, often only briefly. A number of them recovered, but then they later relapsed, and when they relapsed, it was almost always into another chronic depression, but the form of the chronic depression was often very different from the chronic depression that they had come in with in the beginning of the study. So the form of persistent depression changes over time. What's constant is that it tends to be persistent. Uh, and so there really are no clear boundaries between these different forms of chronic depression. It's all variants of one thing, persistent depressive disorder. Next slide, please. So the various forms of chronic depression don't differ from one another. Do they differ from non-chronic depression, non-chronic major depressive disorder? And presumably they do, otherwise there would be no sense of having a separate category for persistent depressive disorder. And in fact, that's the case. There are some pretty substantial differences between persistent depressive disorder and non-chronic major depression. Uh, they differ on comorbidity. So people with persistent depressive disorder are much more likely to also have anxiety disorders, personality disorders, uh, in children, behavior disorders like attention deficit disorder, oppositional defiant disorder, maybe conduct disorder, more likely to have substance use disorders. There are differences in personality. People with persistent depressive disorder have much higher levels of neuroticism, which are sort of you know, a trait-like tendency to experience negative emotions, uh, and much lower levels of extroversion. So lower levels of sort of trait-like positive mood, energy, sociability, enthusiasm, much lower in, uh, on, on that kind of a trait. Um, people with persistent depressive disorder also are more prone to have depressive cognitions or the cognitions that are associated with depression. Uh, cognitive biases like seeing yourself, uh, the world and the future in a negative way, rumination, ruminating in negative ways about things. Uh, I see that there are questions that keep popping up. So we're going to hold the questions to the end if you if you don't mind. Um, uh, uh, people with persistent depressive disorder are much more likely to be suicidal and to uh, attempt suicide. They have much higher levels of childhood adversity and, and maltreatment. They have higher levels of mood disorders in their first degree relatives. And in particular, there's a lot of chronic depression in their relatives. So people with chronic depression not only have depression in their relatives, but chronic depression in their relatives. And lastly, uh, the course and diagnostic stability of persistent depressive disorder also differs from non-chronic major depression. 
I should say that most of these studies have focused on the early onset subtype. And some of these differences may not be so apparent for the late onset subtype. This is early onset persistent depressive disorder. So again, from that 10 year follow up I mentioned, we compared patients with persistent depression and non-persistent major depression over 10 years. And we found that the persistent depressive disorder patients were depressed for a significantly greater proportion of the time. That's not so surprising, but they were depressed for 66% of those 10 years compared to less than a quarter. So that's a pretty substantial difference. They also showed less improvement in their social functioning over time. 20% of the persistent depressive disorder patients attempted suicide, but none of the patients in our non-chronic major depression group did. And 27% of the persistent depressive disorder patients were psychiatrically hospitalized during those 10 years compared to 8% of the non-chronic major depressive patients. So it's a much more severe condition over time, even if at any one point in time, it might appear mild, but over time, it's a much more severe condition. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, one last slide about, about course, and that is that the distinction between persistent depression and non-chronic major depression is fairly stable. So over these 10 years, about half of the persistent depressive disorder patients stayed persistently depressed the entire time. Uh, uh, and, almost, and only 12% of them had a more episodic course where the depression came and went. For the non-chronic major depressive, depressive patients, only one of them in that entire group showed a stable persistent course and two thirds of them had a fluctuating uh, course where they had an episode, got better, maybe had another episode, got better. So it's a very, very stable distinction. Next slide, okay. All right, let me talk a little bit about risk factors for PDD. Uh, and I've already talked about some of them. Next slide, please. So, uh, childhood maltreatment. So this is very well established as a risk, fa risk factor for persistent depressive disorder. A number of studies, uh, retrospective studies where we ask patients with, with PDD about their childhoods, prospective studies where we follow children who have a history or not of maltreatment and see who's more likely to develop a persistent depression. The results are very similar in both sets of studies. Um, and we don't have to go through these, these data, but this, these are data from a study from the Netherlands looking at a large sample of chronic depressives and non-chronic major depressives. And we see that the chronic depression group reports uh, childhood histories of, 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 of greater abuse and, and, and neglect on, uh, on all the, the variables examined. Next slide. Uh, this is a slide for a um, multi-site uh, study across a number of medical centers in the United States, looking at the uh, uh, transmission of depression in family members. And it's comparing patients with chronic depression to those with non-chronic depression and looking at the percentage of their relatives, their parents, children, siblings, who have chronic depression. And we see that the rate of chronic depression is almost twice as high among patients with chronic depression themselves than among those with non-chronic depression. So chronic depression is running in family members. Next slide. Um, so PDD runs in families. It's transmitted across generations. Uh, a little bit more data. This comes from a study that I'm currently doing. We're following a sample of about 600 children from Suffolk County. Uh, we started studying them when they were three years old. We've been following them every three years. They're actually now uh, 21. Um, but this is a, 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 some, some, uh, a paper we did when they were 15. Parents, when, when, when the children came in the study at age three, we, uh, we uh, interviewed the parents about their own histories of depression. Uh, we defined persistence in a way that's a little stricter than the DSM. They had to be depressed most of the time since they were first depressed. Uh, and then at every follow-up at age six, nine, 12, and 15, the parents and the child completed a measure of of depressive symptoms in the children. And we compared the trajectories of the children's depression scores from childhood into adolescence. Next slide, please. And so this graph uh, shows uh, uh, the depression scores of the children based on mother's reports of their 
with the children's depression, depressive symptoms uh, uh, from age six to age 15. There are three lines here. The top line is, uh, uh, represents the children of the mothers with chronic depression. The bottom two lines, which are hard to disentangle, they're right on top of each other, are mothers with non-chronic depression and never depressed mothers. What we see is that the children of the depressed mothers show scores of depressed, show, show uh, levels of depressive symptoms that continue to increase throughout the entire follow-up. Whereas for the children of the non-chronic depressed mothers and the never depressed mothers, their children's depression scores decrease. So in this slide, we're looking at depressed mothers' reports of their children's symptoms. Uh, the next slide, the next slide shows what fathers say about the children of depressed mothers, and they say exactly the same thing. The reports are exactly the same. It's the offspring of the persistently depressed mothers who show this increase in depression over time, and we don't see it in the offspring of the non-depressed mothers and the never depressed mothers. Next slide. Um, the last thing I wanna talk about before we get to treatment is uh, 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 another recent study that uh, my colleagues and I have been involved in. This is with a different sample. And it asks, uh, can we predict the development of early onset persistent depression even before the depression begins? So can we predict it in early adolescence? And do the predictors of persistent depression differ from the predictors of non-persistent depression? So this is a sample of 465 never depressed 14-year-old uh, uh, young women who we followed between the ages 14 and 20 uh, on six occasions doing diagnostic assessments at each occasion. And in this study, we, decide, we, we define persistence as being depressed for a cumulative total of at least 12 months. And uh, so in this sample, there were 16 young women who had persistent depression by the age of 20. There were 90 who had major depressive episodes, but for shorter durations. And there were three, 315 who were never depressed. And we compared the groups on 18 risk factors that were assessed before they had ever met criteria for a depressive disorder. Next slide. Yeah, so, so the 14, the 18 risk factors we looked at were parental history of depression, anxiety, and substance use disorder, a history of milder depression that, was, that didn't meet criteria for diagnosis, a history of anxiety and behavior disorders, parental care and support throughout the child's life, Parental criticism, which was coded from mother's free floating, free narratives, where we asked them to talk about their daughters and we coded how critical they were from what they said. And the adolescents report of the quality of their current relationship with their parents. We also looked at the relationship with their best friend, uh, peer victimization, school performance, which we got from their school records, several measures of personality, positive emotionality, which is really the same thing as extroversion. Uh, neuroticism, rumination, self-criticism, and uh, thoughts and behaviors involving self-harm. Next uh, slide, please. So uh, what we found was the persistent group were depressed for 33 months out of that, uh, out of that period, roughly half the time of the follow-up period, compared to only four months for the non-chronic group. Now we defined the persistent group as being depressed more, but we didn't expect to see such a stark difference, 33 versus four months. The persistent group comprised about 40% of all the depressed cases in the sample, but they accounted for 84% of the months depressed. So persistent depression is carrying a disproportionate share of the burden of being depressed. The persistent group had higher levels of risk than the never depressed group on 16 out of 18 of the risk factors. So almost every risk factor uh, differentiated the persistent group from the never depressed group. The non-chronic depressed group had higher levels of risk on about half the risk factors. So there were a number of predictors, but not nearly as many as for the persistent depressed group. And the persistent depressed group had higher levels of risk than the non-chronic depressed group on half the risk factor. Uh, in no case did the non-chronic group have a higher level of risk than the persistent group on any of the 18 risk factors. So in the next slide, I'll tell us something about which, which, which risk, risk factors predicted persistent depression. So compared to those who developed non-persistent depression, the 
young women who develop persistent depression had higher levels of depression even before they met criteria for diagnosis. They reported lower levels of parental care. Uh, they had poorer relationship, current relationships with their parents and their best friend. Their school performance was already lower. They had lower levels of positive emotionality, so less optimism, less positive mood, less energy. And they were more self-critical and uh, more likely to think about or engage in self-harm. Um, and, and, and for a number of these variables, there were actually no, different, no differences between the non-persistent depressed group and the never depressed group, suggesting some of these variables are specific to persistent depression. Can I have the next slide? So, so, so just, just to summarize, uh, girls who are going to develop persistent depression have much higher levels on a host of risk factors uh, compared to those who will never who won't develop depression, and also compared to those who will develop much more time-limited depressions. And in some cases, those risk factors are more severe. In some cases, they are specific to persistent depression, and we don't see them at all in the non-persistent depressed cases. So there's both a, a sort of a quantitative and a qualitative difference in girls who are going to develop persistent depression even before the onset of persistent depression. Okay, um, let's go on and just talk for a moment about treatment. Um, it is challenging to treat people with persistent depression, and it can be, uh, um, you know, it, it, it can be frustrating and uh, uh, it can be difficult for clinicians. Next slide. But it can also be successful. So. I'm going to focus largely on adults because there's almost no literature, there is, is really no literature on uh, uh, co controlled trials on treatment of PDD in, in youth, uh, a huge gap in the literature. And I'm going to focus mainly on meta-analyses, which, which are a technique of combining many studies uh, uh, in the literature, you know, combining the entire set of relevant studies in the literature uh, at once. And in adults, meta-analyses indicate that for persistent depressive disorder, antidepressant medication is superior to placebo pills. The major classes of antidepressants are all equally effective. They differ in side effects, but they don't differ in terms of effectiveness. Interestingly, persistent depressive disorder has a lower placebo response rate uh, than non-persistent depressive disorder, uh, suggesting that uh, persistent depressive disorder actually may get a little bit more benefit from medication. Some of the benefit that you know from from that that persistent that non-persistent depressive disorder gets is from placebo, and there are fewer placebo responses in persistent depressive disorder. There are no clinical trials of medication for PDD in youth. There just are not. Um, in general, youth tend not to respond to antidepressant medication as well as adults do. Uh, so that suggests that in youth, uh, medication should not be a first-line treatment unless we're dealing with particularly severe cases uh, with, with a great risk of suicide or psychotic symptoms. Uh, but medication is, is, is perhaps not, not the, way, the best way to go, at least first, uh, first off. Next slide, please. Uh, there are not very many controlled clinical trials uh, of psychotherapy for persistent depression in adults. There are none in youth, um, not many in adults, but there's some. Uh, this literature, the meta-analyses suggest that psychotherapy is more effective than a number of different comparisons. Uh, pill placebo, treatment as usual, non-specific treatments like um, self-help manuals or supportive psychotherapy or being put on a wait list. So, you know, there are a number of comparison conditions in these studies, but psychotherapy tends to be more effective than all of them. But the effect sizes are small. Um, so, so psychotherapy is moderately effective, but we still have a long way to go. Uh, so the next, let, uh, I'll ignore the, the, the next point. Can I have that last slide again for a second? Um, one other thing that comes from this literature is that, uh, a minimum of 18 therapy sessions 
either weekly or biweekly, it's really necessary to begin to see an effect of psychotherapy. So really brief, brief psychotherapy is, is just not very effective for persistent depression. It really takes a sustained effort uh, to, to make a dent in persistent depression. Next slide. Uh, the most common psychotherapy for depression uh, is, is Aaron Beck's cognitive therapy, but remarkably, there are no studies of cognitive therapy for persistent depressive disorder. The best studied psychotherapies in persistent depressive disorder are interpersonal psychotherapy, which is a you know, which which you know comes uh, out of psychodynamic psychotherapy, uh, and a form of therapy called the cognitive behavioral analysis system of psychotherapy or CBASP. I know that's a mouthful. CBASP was developed specifically for chronic depression by a psychologist named Jim McCullough at Virginia Commonwealth University. And I'll talk for a minute about it because I think it is a very, a, 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 our most effective tool for treating persistent depressive disorder at this point. Uh, CBASP focuses on teaching interpersonal problem solving skills. The goals are to change patterns of coping, improve interpersonal skills, help people understand the consequences of their behavior on other people, and therefore to interact more effectively. Next slide. CBASP has, a num has, has several different components to it, but perhaps the foundational component is something that McCullough calls situational analysis. And situational analysis, what you do is, is you focus on an interpersonal stressor, stressful interpersonal situation that occurs in a specific slice of time. So it's not talking about relationships in general or a particular relationship over time, but a specific event that can be located at a specific time and place. And the patient needs to describe what happened in that situation, how they interpreted what happened or sort of what they made of it, uh, how they behaved in that situation, how things turned out. And then they have to say, how would they have liked things to have turned out? Uh, and you compare the actual outcome to the desired outcome. Did they match? Well, of course they didn't. It wouldn't be a problematic situation if they matched. Uh, and then you ask, well, is the outcome they desire actually achievable? In many cases, it's not. And that's part of the problem that the patient is trying to do something that really can't be done. Uh, and if that's the case, what would be a, an outcome that they might want that actually could potentially come about? Uh, and then once that's done, um, you go back through this process in a remediation process uh, and ask, well, is there another way that you could have construed the situation that might have been more likely to lead to an outcome you wanted? Is there something you could have done that's more likely to lead to an outcome you wanted? And then the final stage is talking about how the lessons from this might generalize to other problematic situations that you've talked with the patient about in, in therapy. So I don't know, really, really quick example. So, so uh, you know, an adolescent comes home had a really difficult day. They were, you know, they were uh, uh, bullied by their peers. They come in the front door. They're, you know, upset. They slam their book bag on the floor. Slam the door. Uh, you know, mom hears the door slam, sees the, you know, and and sort of, um, you know, gets upset and 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 yells at the at the child. Sort of, you know, don't slam the door. Don't, you know, pick up your book bag. And it, you know, the, the situation escalates, they're both yelling at each other and the child then turns around and leaves the house and slams the door behind them. So, you know, so that's what happened. Um, you know, how, how, did, how did the child interpret what happened? Well, you know, mom just sort of, you know, you know, was, you know, you know was only thinking about herself and, and didn't understand, didn't try to understand me and just sort of went off on me. Well, what did you do? You know, describe what was the outcome? What was the desired? Well, well, what I really would have liked was to your know, mom to be nice to me and and maybe you know sit with me and and make me a snack. So didn't get the desired outcome. Well, is that desired outcome actually achievable? Well, in many cases, you think it would be, but there are some families in which it really would not be. Mom is never going to be supportive and warm, uh, and you have to decide 
whether in this particular situation it's achievable, it's an achievable outcome or not. If it's not achievable, what is the least bad outcome that could have been achieved? If it is achievable, how could the child have thought about the situation in a different way? For example, well, you know, mom doesn't have the information and maybe she had a hard day. Uh, is there something you could have done that would have made this, the outcome turn out differently? Well, yeah, I could have you know, told her that I was upset. Um, so so that's, that's kind of uh, a, a taste of what situational analysis looks like. Can I have the next slide? Uh, in 2016, there was a meta-analysis of CBASP efficacy trials all, all in adults. And it found that CBASP is superior to interpersonal therapy and to treatment as usual, equivalent to medication. Um, there are no trials in youth, but there is some anecdotal evidence suggesting that adolescents may be a really good population to do CBASP in because it's a very concrete kind of treatment. Can I have the next slide? Um, well, this, is, this is a study since 2016, which shows the same thing, that CBASP is more effective than supported therapy. Uh, next slide. Um, yeah, uh, CBAS was particularly useful for the tougher cases of persistent depressive disorder. So predictors of CBAS superiority to supportive therapy um, were a higher level of depression, comorbid psychiatric disorders, a history of physical or emotional neglect, and a history of failing to respond to antidepressant medication. So CBASP is particularly useful for the more complicated cases. Next slide. Uh, there is also a literature on the combination of medication and psychotherapy for persistent depression. And that is actually a, a very optimistic and promising literature. The combination of, of psychotherapy and medication is significantly more effective for PDD then medication is alone or psychotherapy is alone. And there've been several meta-analyses that have shown that. Uh, and it's interesting that in non-chronic major depression, combination treatment usually doesn't, doesn't, uh, isn't usually much more effective than either medication alone or psychotherapy alone. But for persistent depressive disorder, that combination seems to be particularly effective. So it's more time consuming, it's more expensive, but, but perhaps that is the optimal treatment for persistent depression. Next slide. All right. Um, so people with persistent depressive disorder, even when they recover, they have a very high risk of relapse. And the relapse is often into another persistent depression, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, there are uh, a handful of studies that have shown that if people with persistent depressive disorder get better on medication, Keeping them on medication helps prevent a relapse. Uh, there are very few comparable data on whether people should stay in psychotherapy, but the next slide. But, but this, is, this is the one such study, and it's, it's a study that uh, I was involved in a number of years ago in which we had a group of adult patients uh, who uh, received CBASP and recovered on CBASP. And at the end of treatment, 42% of them stayed on CBASP, 40 of them stopped CBASP and came in for assessment only visits. And they came back once a month for a year. And we found that uh, the recurrence rate among the CBASP patients was only was, was less than 3%. It was 21% in the assessment only cases, which is pretty good, but considerably lower among the CBASP patients. So it suggests that even after people recover on, uh, on it from psychotherapy, uh, it's worthwhile to continue to have sort of lower dose or less frequent uh, maintenance sessions over a period of time. Next slide. All right, so let me wrap up so we have some time for questions. So just, just to summarize, persistent depressive disorder is common in clinical settings. It's often unrecognized. Uh, there are a few differences between different forms of persistent depressive disorder, but there are very significant differences between persistent depressive disorder and non-chronic major depression. Some of the uh, more important predictors of persistent depressive disorder, particularly childhood and early and adolescent onset persistent depressive disorder, are early adversity, uh, temperament, uh, familial uh, risk, and interpersonal problems. 
Persistent depressive disorder is challenging to treat, but pharmacotherapy and some psychotherapies are moderately effective, at least in adults. Combination treatment may be the most effective approach. Maintenance treatment is effective in reducing the risk of recurrence, um, but there really is a paucity of data on treating persistent depressive disorder in youth. Uh, it's, it's, you know, there's a need for more work. And I think CVASP is particularly worth exploring in, in an adolescent population. Let me stop there and uh, I would be very happy to answer questions or, or uh, entertain comments. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Klein. So yes, we're going to um, begin answering the questions that were submitted during your presentation. Um, again, as a reminder, you can still submit questions to the chat box, and we will try to do our best to get through as many as possible. Um, so let's see. Um, so Dr. Klein, um, as you were covering the uh, PDD and the intergener intergenerational transmission of depression, a couple of questions came in. So one question was, do you think PDD is transmitted across generations because of genetics or because of parents' limited ways of engaging with their infants or their young children um, or a combination thereof um, yeah. was first part of that question? Yeah, yeah. No, that, I mean, that, that's a, a great question. I don't have an answer to it. We just don't have the data. Um, the kinds of studies we really need to answer that are twin studies or adoption studies where we can separate out uh, you know, the environment from, from the genetic contribution. There are no such studies for persistent depressive disorder. Uh, I, you know, if you're gonna take a bet, um, you know, it would have to be on the combination of the two. Um, you know, people with persistent depressive disorder have sort of a double whammy. Um, they probably have a greater genetic predisposition and they're often coming from particularly uh, problematic environments, um, but, there, I mean, there are no hard data on this. Right. And then, so what are your thoughts around, um, you know, as a follow-up to this question, and, and you might've, I guess, actually touched on it a little bit, but um, children internalizing their parents' depressive states or their presentation, um, is that something, I mean, again, probably no data, but what are your thoughts around that? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I mean, it's interesting. I mean, uh, parental depression affects children's symptoms, children's symptoms affect parents' depression. I mean, it's, it is a reciprocal process that sort of goes back and forth. So I, you know, I imagine that there is some sort of modeling or, or mirroring or internalization of the parents' depressive symptoms in some sense that that is sort of, you know, a nor you know the, sort of the, the affective tone that one expects from the world. Uh, and at the same time, depression in the child also often exacerbates the parental depression. So there's this, they're, they're just so intertwined uh, mm -hmm. throughout development. Right, absolutely. So yes, yeah, certainly seems to be more of a directional um, relationship as well. Um, and then in terms of, you know, the, this, um, this section as well, um, I know you were presenting on the mother's persistent depression and there was you know, you spoke about the father's reports of the children's um, depression scores, but um, there came, a question came in about whether or not there was any data collected in regards to the the father's depression. Yeah, 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 we did, but, but the, you know, the rate of depression is higher in women than in men, so we had fewer depressed fathers, and so we didn't have enough depressed fathers to break them into those that were persistent and non-persistent, so we, we did not look at that. Uh, I have no reason to think that the results would be very different for fathers than for mothers. Although in general, um, maternal depression seems to have a slightly greater impact on children than paternal depression. We look at the larger literature, um, but it's not a big difference. So I, I, I would expect that probably we would see similar things in fathers. We just didn't have a large enough number. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you for that. Um, and I know, you know, as you were going through some of the data that you had collected, you did specify um, that the sample of children were primarily or, or mostly white and middle class. But we had a couple of questions as to whether or not there was any data collected or, you know, just sort of your overall thoughts around um, any data for children of color 
um, as well as underprivileged children. Um, you know, there was also something along the lines of immigrant families, given the context that we're in right now, where there is, um, you know, a, a large degree of families coming in. Any data that you might have collected or that you're aware of that speaks specifically to um, historically oppressed or marginalized communities? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's, there, there's, there's, a, uh, there's not a lot of data. Um, in, in our study, um, a number, the numbers, of, I mean, it, it is a largely middle-class white uh, sample. We had to take people who could easily commute to the campus, come to the campus uh, for assessments and that sort of limited uh, who, who, who could be in the study. And I don't, the numbers were just not large enough to be able to say anything, you know, with any confidence about any, any other subgroups. Uh, the larger literature, uh, you know, the persistent depression literature is such sort of a small and you know, poor stepchild of the depression literature that there really is not very much. There, there is evidence that among black Americans, depression tends to be more persistent uh, than it is among other racial and ethnic groups. Uh, which I think is a really important fact. But uh, other than that, there's really not a lot that comes to mind. Yeah, and I think that just calls attention to the fact that, you know, a lot of the, the studies certainly need to be more diverse, right, to really capture what's reflecting um, in our society. Um, and obviously knowing that there might be additional struggles and challenges for certain folks. Um, all right, so um, again, in the interest of time, um, so I know you you covered this, but maybe um, a little bit more specific here. There was a question along the lines of, you know, is, is there a way to prevent intergenerational depression or what are some of those things um, that maybe we can do knowing that there is a, a relationship here? Um, anything specific to add to that? Yeah. Um, well, well, I mean, there are, of course, things that, that, that you know, at the macro level that are critically important, um, but sort of at the sort of more at the individual level, uh, you know, I think there's there's pretty good evidence that treating depression in mothers helps the mental health of their children. And these studies have not looked specifically at persistent depression, but for depression in general, you know, treat, treating mothers helps children. Uh, and I would suspect that treating children also also helps mothers and and certainly helps the children themselves. So so. I, I mean, I think that there. I think that treatments are moderately effective for depression in both adults and children. So I think that is, you know, that is a tool that mental health clinicians have. Um, you know, there's certainly a lot that can be done at the level of the community, at the level of schools, uh, at, at, you know, at the larger level of, you know, in terms of things like poverty, uh, that probably are much more important than anything we can do with individuals. But you know, there are things I think we can do with you know, to, to break the cycle with individuals. Yeah, no, thank you. And I appreciate that, right? And it seems that you're certainly, you know, alluding to trauma-informed interventions um, and really looking at the larger picture, right? Um, what's actually also happening within children and or the households of children and, and families. Um, so um, I'm going to jump around here. Someone did ask about any literature, um, as, as you're mentioning, right, all these other things that are happening um, around nutrition and persistent depressive disorder. Um, so I'm thinking even, you know, food insecurity, but the yeah. role that food is is also medicine for some folks. Um, and I think on a cultural level, too, that there is this this larger um, concept that's important. So what are you, your thoughts around that? Yeah, um, I, I don't think I can shed any any real light on that. I mean, I think that and you know, nobody has looked at that in the context of persistent depressive disorder, at mm -hmm. least not yet. Uh, for depression more generally, you know, there is more and more evidence every day uh, that, that, you know, that healthy nutrition, healthy lifestyle, exercise are all just about as effective in treating depression as most medications and psychotherapies we have for depression. Um, so I would imagine probably the same thing is true for persistent depressive disorder, but like I say, there, there are no data on that. I know. Yeah, thank you. And I appreciate you sort of highlighting where are there, there are a lot of gaps 
in the literature um, as well. So um, interesting for any folks um, that might be, you know, doing research or a part of that field is really integrating that. Um, let's see, another question that came in, um, focusing around uh, the treatment intervention that you spend a little bit of time on, on the CBAS. Um, so there was a comment in question here. CBAS requires um, clients to have some level of insight with traumatized children and youth, this might be difficult at times given the history of trauma. So would this be recommended for a child or youth um, that clinicians have noticed might have challenges with insights? Um, I mean, I, I, to some degree, yes. Uh, but I think that CBAS requires less insight than many forms of psychotherapy like cognitive therapy. I mean, it's really pretty concrete. It's about you know, what did you do? What do you want? How do you, what do you need to do in order to get what you want? And it encourages sort of a future, future thinking and sort of a means ends kind of thinking, cause consequences kind of thinking that I think is uh, often short, short circuited or, or, or not present in adolescence and very useful for adolescents. So, uh, so, so, so I'm not so sure about pre-adolescence. Um, but for adolescents, um, you know, I, I, I don't think it takes as much insight as many forms of psychotherapy. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, so I do want to be mindful of time. Um, you know, we did get through as many questions as we could. There are a couple of comments, certainly thanking you for this presentation, Dr. Klein. Um, on our next slide. Um, I do want to um, highlight that we have a couple of upcoming events. So just wondering if we can maybe advance to the next slide. Um, so we do have um, a couple of events coming up. Schema therapy, a three-hour training um, for clinicians who are working with individuals with narcissistic personality disorder. We also have um, another offering on supporting positive Black youth development within a racialized society. Um, so if you haven't signed up for those, and certainly those sound interesting, please visit our website so you can register for those. Um, I do want to thank you again, Dr. Klein, for answering those questions and for a great presentation. Um, for folks on the line now, um, the recording and slides will be available within the next two to three business days, so be on the lookout for that. Um, and again, I do want to thank everyone for attending today's webinar. Please visit our website for any additional trainings and information. There will also be a feedback survey that pops up as you close out. Uh, please take the time to fill it out as we do look at your feedback um, and it certainly informs our future offerings. Um, so with that, again, thank you, Dr. Klein. And I want to thank everyone else for joining us. Have a great rest of the day, everyone.